Well, good morning. And happy Pentecost. Again, while we as Baptists, I'll, <laughs> actually that's not entirely true. The Baptists in the South claim that they are a non-liturgical people. Uh, a situation that gets us picked on by many other denominations. What we mean by that as a faith is that there are restraints that we do not behold ourselves to out of the fact that they become traditions of men over time. And they wear on their usefulness as a tool of the church. But in this case, the church's calendar itself can be a teaching tool. Just as every time that we gather as a body of believers, it becomes a celebration of the Christ event in history. We, the body of Christ comes together. The word and the testimony is broken in song first and then proclaimed from the, the word of God. And we remember the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord through the ordinances of communion, which today we will be observing, or through baptism. And then just as the disciples now become apostles were sent forth, so do we, when we leave the sanctuary, go out into what is effectively our mission field. For we are not merely an ordained priesthood that are called from a select few, but we are a priesthood of all believers. The apostle Peter calls us a peculiar people in that right. Peculiar because of our hope. Peculiar because of our attitudes changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Peculiar because of all people, we have the guarantee of life eternal. But not only are we a, a peculiar people, he goes in to tell us that we are a royal priesthood. Which means that on behalf of a fallen, fecal, fallen feeble, fickle, finite humanity, we go boldly before the throne of grace, petitioning God on their behalf and going to that humanity, petitioning them on God's behalf. We are become agents of reconciliation in the hope that through our words, through our actions, through our display of love and through our bravery when it comes to sharing the gospel message with others, that names may be added to the Lamb's book of life, that lives may be transformed, and that the community, which is the church, the bride of Christ, adorns herself prepared for the wedding that is to come. The fruit of a Christian is more Christians. How often do we forget about that? And the promises that God has made to each individual believer that help them along through that path. So your salvation, thankfully, is not your responsibility. Your salvation is maintained on the shoulders of God himself. The same way that God, when he appeared to Abraham and had Abraham prepare this covenantal walk, put Abraham to sleep so that he couldn't take any of the responsibility on himself. God still today shoulders the responsibility for his covenants with his people. If you are a member of the body of Christ, God takes responsibility for your salvation and for your sanctification, for your spiritual growth. But we have a responsibility too, not to maintain ourselves as being saved, but in participating in the activities that help us to grow spiritually, to mature as Christians. That happens Primarily by one of two ways that we enrich ourselves, that we become enriched, excuse me. The first way is through the Word of God. The second way is through experiencing and connecting with the Holy Spirit of God. Ironically, this is one of the very least favorite and least taught things from our branch of the Christian faith. It's often joked about that the Pentecostals stole the Baptist shout and that we've been pouting about it ever since. There were a time, there was a time when Baptists believed in celebrating their faith, in raising their voices to God, not only in proclaiming the word of God, 
but in celebrating the fact that of all people, we have more hope, more love, more charity. We have the family of God that is given to us as a gift. We have a direct and personal and intimate relationship with our Creator. We have to be sorrowful about. We have every cause to sing, every cause to celebrate, every cause to seek in obedience. And in passion, the will of our Heavenly Father who loves us and calls us to love others in return. And the only way that that is possible is if we understand the ministry of the person of the Godhead that is in our midst today. And that's the Holy Spirit of God. We're going to talk a little bit about him and about his role and his influence in us at present and his history with the people of God. And I'm going to start in a very, uh, probably in some of your hearings, peculiar place. I'm going to take a look at a Pentecostal celebration that happened, not the denomination, but the festival in the Old Testament, in the book of Numbers, because I want you to see some truths about who the Holy Spirit is. This comes to us from Numbers chapter 11. Numbers chapter 11. Where the prophet, the mediator of the Old Covenant, writes, Moses went out and told the people what the Lord had said. To set some background for you, the people of God were starting to grumble. God had provided water for them. God had provided food for them in the form of manna. But for months now, all that they had to eat was manna. It was supplied by God. Apparently, it was as sweet in the mouth as honey. But it was something that lacked variety. So they were, they were baking it. They were griddling it. They were crushing it up, turning it into a paste and uh, making different things out of it. Uh, manna pancakes, manna loaves, manna cotti. They were getting tired of it because all that they had, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, manna, manna, manna. So they were starting to grumble against God in private, thinking that he wouldn't hear about it. And they started to get bold and, 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 and speak against his workers, the prophet Moses, and the priesthood that was forming around Aaron, his brother. And Moses actually goes before God. In anger, he tells them, if you have any love for me whatsoever, these people are unruly. I can't do it by myself. Just kill me now. I'm sure there are some pastors out there that would sympathize. So he has taken... But God, through his son, his, excuse me, his father-in-law, Jephro, actually says, it is not good that you should take the entire burden of such a multitude on your individual shoulders. You can't do it all by yourself. Pray to God. And so he does, and God answers and says that this is true. One person, while one person can make a difference, one person should not assume the responsibility for the entire nation. So I want you to pick 70 people who you identify as people of good repute, people who are godly, people who are elders of the nation of Israel. And I will take my spirit and I will impart it on them too, signifying that they are to be your judges. And this is how the original class of judges of Israel was ordained. So we continue reading. Moses went out and told the people what the Lord had said, and he brought together 70 of their elders and had them stand around the tent, meaning the tent of meeting, the tabernacle. The Lord came down in the cloud and spoke with him, and he took some of the power of the Spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And when the Spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not do so again. This is a difference from the Old Testament the Holy Spirit's ministry in the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. We'll get into that in just a second. However, two other men whose names were Eldad and Medad had remained in the camp. They were listed among the elders but did not go out of their tents. Yet the Spirit also rested on them and they prophesied in the camp. 
and a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad were prophesying in the camp. <coughs> Excuse me. Joshua, the son of Nun, who had been Moses' aide since his youth, spoke up and said, Moses, my Lord, stop them. They have been disobedient. They were not able to join the meeting. They were lazy. They didn't show up. They shouldn't have this kind of authority, especially one of a prophet. <clears throat> Moses, my Lord, stopped them, but Moses replied, are you jealous for my sake? And I want you to notice this. In fact, turn here in your copy of God's word right now and underline this next statement. I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. This was Moses' wish. There was a spiritual issue at play that was here. These people were growing distant from God through disobedience. The people that God had established his covenant with, that he loves, had grown obstinate and disobedient. They grumbled against God in private. And God heard it. They grumbled against God's chosen in public. And he heard it. They desired, they actually desired to return to the trappings of the place of slavery. See, being set free wasn't good enough. Having God's provision in their midst wasn't good enough. Having God's presence in their midst wasn't good enough. Were we were back in Egypt where we had melons and cucumbers and fish, where we had beef and we had all these other things. We were better off as slaves. Can you imagine the anger of God when he heard the people that he brought out of the land of slavery suddenly say that they wished that they were back in chains? How often do the people of the church do likewise? When we backslide, we put on the old clothes, the trappings of our own slavery, a spiritual slavery. How does God look at that? The practical issue was that the people had to deepen their relationship with God. They were growing distant. They needed to be pulled back into God's embrace. The people were too numerous to be ministered to or be held accountable or to be led in the paths of God's vision by a single individual. They were too many to administrate by one individual. Someone had to give them God's vision. Other people had to administrate underneath that vision to put it together. One person couldn't do it alone. So the hope that Moses expresses here, and I want you to get this down in your notes, because this hope is realized later on through Christ. The hope was that God would bring his people into a closer walk with him. That he would not write his law on tablets of stone to be studied, but he would write his law where? On their hearts. That he would transform, regenerate, their passions, that he would change their very natures, that he would spread the responsibility of ministry from the one person to the multitude, and that God himself would communicate with them directly. Does that sound familiar? This was Moses' hope, the same thing that he proclaimed to Joshua, were that all the people touched by God directly, were they all in a closer walk with him? Were they all transformed by the renewing of their minds? And then we see that finally come to pass. As we read our scripture for this morning, in Acts chapter 2. And when the day, when the feast of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be as tongues of fire separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit had enabled them.
Moses' wish was finally fulfilled. The opportunity that we have from that first Pentecost that they didn't have in the Old Testament, that generations of believers before the coming of Christ could not even understand, was that you don't have to have the tablets of stone to know what God expects of you. You don't have to have an intermediary behind a curtain to go to God on your behalf and declare your repentance. You don't have to have a prophet come and draw you closer to God and remind you that he is a God of love as well as a God of judgment. That he is a God who has mercy and expects righteousness. Be holy as as I am holy. Now you have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit of God with you, in you, and upon you from the moment that you declare Christ as your Savior and Lord. Sealed, as Paul tells us, unto the day of redemption. No need for the, the middleman. You now have the ability, as Albert was telling us just a little bit ago, you have the right as declared in Scripture, to go boldly before the throne of grace any time that you want to, that you may receive mercy in your hour of need, knowing that he hears you. In the book of Revelation that we're about to study, I believe it's in chapter 8, the angel brings a bowl of incense that lifts to God. And he breathes in the prayers of the believer the people of earth, and he causes all the noise of heaven. He causes the wars on earth. He causes the very praise going on in his midst by the saints, by the angels, by the created beings. He calls it all to stop in that instant so he can hear you. God values his connection with you so much that he sent his very presence to live inside of you that you may be a reflection of his own son. So as the story goes, the apostles were now without the immediate presence of Christ. He had ascended to the Father to assume his role as our great high priest. And in his place, he promised that a new comforter would come. And as they're probably in the, it's assumed the upper room that they had their last supper with him. Although Luke doesn't tell that extensively. But they were in a rented spot in Jerusalem. And the whole city was filled with a rushing wind, a wind that you couldn't help but hear one that stirred the people to leave their homes to figure out what was going on, the rushing sound of a hurricane. In the same scene that we just poured out, in the, that we just read over in the book of Numbers was now poured out, but with one very significant difference. Instead of resting upon them and then leaving, it was now sealed on the people of God. And not just on these select few, not just on these elders, not just on these prophets, but on all of them as tongues of flame popped into existence. And like the flame of a candle, without the candle, it rested on the heads of those that were now believers who had accepted the sacrifice of Christ and who were made permanently clean by his redeeming blood. And they began to preach in languages that were not their own. And as the people heard the rush of the wind, Sailing through the streets of Jerusalem, they went outside to see what all the commotion was going on. And from the windows, they started to hear these people proclaiming the word of God, but they heard it with a difference. You see, this is one of only three times a year. The Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks, is only one of three times every year that every able-bodied Jew has to come to Jerusalem. It was a required feast. So you had Jews that were still in Parthia and Persia. You had Jews that were still in Greece. You had still uh, Jews that were in Macedonia, that were in Asia Minor, that were all over the world, in Rome, all throughout, who had to come home. 
And as they were entering the city streets, as they were hearing the rush of the wind, as they were starting to hear the word of God in their midst preaches like never before, they didn't start hearing it in, in, in the old and decrepit uh, language of Hebrew, which was no longer in common use. They started hearing it in whatever their native tongue was. This will get your attention. The Greeks, the Jews who grew up in Greece started hearing it in Greek. Those that grew up in Babylon started hearing it in Farsi. Those that were, if there were Chinese Jews that came back home, they would start hearing it in Mandarin. This was a sight to behold because this was a sign that now there were no limits on who the people of God could be. Continuing in our reading, Peter stood up with the eleven and raised his voice to address the crowd as they came outside preaching. As they started seeing the crowd form and hearing the word, he addressed them, fellow Jews and all of you who will live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken to you by the prophet Joel. And he quotes Joel chapter two here. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on some of the people. I will pour out my spirit on just the prophets. No, I will pour my spirit out on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will turn to darkness and the moon will turn to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. Hearken to me, people of Judea. The time is at hand and this is the calm before the storm. This is the day of repentance before the day of the Lord. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you, through him, as you yourselves know, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Just as David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand and will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices in my body, by body, excuse me, will also rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known the path of life and you fill me with joy in your presence. So fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried in his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on an everlasting throne seeing what was to come. He spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that, was, that he was not abandoned in the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God raised him, raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand as he received from the Father the proclaimed Holy Spirit and has poured out what you know, what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, Yahweh said to Adonai. What on earth does that mean? This is what that means. God said to the person over me. And this is David the king. So who's over the king? Christ. Yahweh said to Christus, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. Therefore, let all of Israel be assured of this. God made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, then what shall we do? And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, each and every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. 
and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all those who are far off, for, whom, for all of whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about how many does it say? 3,000 were added to their number that day. So let's talk a little bit about what just happened. Jesus promised when he said another comforter would come that he would teach them all things and that he, meaning the new comforter, would bring to their remembrance all the things that Jesus has taught them. Peter was a businessman and he was a fisherman. And it is the testimony of the previous scriptures of the Bible up to his, this point in his life that when he tried to say something, it was open mouth, insert, foot. Eloquent pastor he was not. Spokesman for the cause, not a good one. And yet when the Holy Spirit came down, when the comforter that was promised had been sealed upon his heart, one individual stood up before the city of Jerusalem. And while the other ten were prophesying, preaching, and teaching, he explains to this crowd the gospel message. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Believe and repent. Be baptized. You will be saved for all who call upon the name of the Lord. Not just Jews. Even Samaritans. Even the other Israelites from the north. And all those of around the world, everyone made in the image of God now has access to the throne. Repent and be baptized and you will be saved and receive the power that is the Holy Spirit. Spiritual issue. The prophets were made clean only temporarily. They had to go through the ceremonial uh, washing. They had to go through the ceremonial sacrifice. They had to have all their sins imbued upon a poor, defenseless, helpless, yet innocent animal whose blood was shed on their behalf. For the wages of sin is death. Something had to die in their place. Over and over and over again. Sacrifices could only stay off sin. It couldn't cure it. Sacrifices had to be offered. The Spirit was therefore not sealed to them, but its ministry would rest upon them and then leave. The fallen nature was still very present in them, but the solution through Christ and through his sacrifice is a perpetual sacrifice had been made in propitiation of God's wrath, meaning that this one sacrifice called off all the wrath that God could generate through every sin of those who would accept that sacrifice from that point on. There was no need to keep sacrificing animals. There was no need for Christ to climb back upon the cross. For now, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And God's wrath is satisfied. The old covenant had been fulfilled. His sacrifice was perfect. His righteousness has been accredited to our account. And we stand as clean before God. Therefore, the Spirit is sealed upon the believer. And the Spirit equips and calls each and every believer ministry and that seems to take some Christians by surprise there was a day before 1950 that it was understood as Baptist because as I've taught you before there is this Baptist distinctive that is part of a litany of our distinctive beliefs that says that we are a priesthood of all believers meaning that if you are a member of Highland Baptist Church you're part of the ministerial staff of Highland Baptist Church you have responsibilities to this church that includes being a minister in some way, shape, or form. It could be in the building, it could be out of the building, it could be doing something as simple as teaching, providing hospitality, but nevertheless, you have a responsibility if you are part of this or any local church. And God calls us and equips us to that purpose. From the voice of Jesus himself, he tells us, if you love me, keep my what? This is how we demonstrate our love for Christ is that we obey him 
And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, another comforter to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be where? In you. The paraclete in the original language, he who walks beside. It's translated in this particular translation an advocate. And to understand what the old King James means, you need to understand the Latin root of the word comfort, which doesn't mean to wipe your tears away, even though he does fulfill that purpose too. How many of you know anything about music? Have ever been in band, choir? Have had a recorder placed in your hand by somebody at some point in time? Come means with. Forte, which means with power. Forte, that little F on the piece of music that means I get to play out now. Pianists and organists especially love to see the letter F. It's probably their favorite letter. But it means what Christ is saying, what was interpreted by the, by the, the people of Elizabeth in England, was that the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, would not just rest upon you, he would bring power from on high to you, just as Jesus had predicted. Enabling you, transforming you on the inside to be something greater than you were beforehand. Someone greater than beforehand. Something else I want you to notice really quickly. The Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is not a force. We have kind of a Jedi mentality of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not at our command. He is a person of the Godhead, the three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Not only that, but he gives gifts and strength as he wills. Based on our relationship, it's transformed in Christ. Paul defines it this way. Now each one, to each and every one of you, as members of the body of Christ, the Spirit is given for the common good. Not just for you individually, but for us as a whole, as the body of Christ. To one there is given the spirit of message of wisdom, to another the message of knowledge by means of the same spirit. To another faith by that same spirit, to another the gifts of healing by one spirit. To another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits. To another speaking in different kinds of tongues or languages, and to another the interpretation of those languages. All of these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and He distributes them to each one, just as He determines, just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts are from, are form one body, which is Jesus Christ. What Paul is trying to say here is that each and every one of you have been equipped for a certain ministry within the congregation of believers, within this or, or another local church. And he has given you a set of talents on top of the fruit of the Spirit, which you manifest in, the, in your personality, in your conduct, your conversation, in your character. He's given you the ability to fulfill a certain role to make the body of Christ function. So you are not just an individual, you are part of a group, a new and a mysterious organization, which is also an organism we call the church. Unlike anything else, it's been called by Christ, assembled through the Holy Spirit, endowed with an ability to do things that no other organization can do no other way. You fulfill a ministry within the church. And the only way that you can realize that fully, number one, is by being a part of the church, and two, taking and engaging in the ministries and the fellowship of the church. So when I tell you to please join AB Women, I mean that so that you can take part and so that others know the part that you play. When I ask for the AB men to come together every month, the same thing. We need each other. In fellowship, we need each other. In work, we need each other. We need to know what skills we all possess. We need to know what talents we have been given by God. We need to know that we can rely on each other. When we show up together, and the only way that can be accomplished is by the gathering of yourselves together. Rebuking not, as some are in the habit of do, uh, as some are in the habit of doing according to Hebrews, but all the more so, gathering as often as you can as we see the day of the Lord approaching. That's Scripture. The ministry of the Spirit, number one, 
is to transform you in such a way that you exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, goodness, faithfulness, forbearance, patience, and self-control. This enables unity within the body of Christ. Because if we didn't forgive others as we ourselves are forgiven, things would fall apart very quickly. One argument over whose fried chicken is better than the other person and we're done. Baptist churches have a really bad habit of splitting as much as we come together. The Holy Spirit enables us to keep functioning because His love, His forgiveness, His grace catches on. And that keeps us functioning the same way that lubrication keeps an engine going. So it enables unity. The, the Holy Spirit, He, excuse me, enables the building also of a testimony because if you exhibit the love, joy, peace, goodness, faithfulness, patience, self-control, then people understand that there's something different about you. They see that difference lived out in you and that's a difference you can proclaim to others. It enables a sense of community because we call ourselves brothers and sisters and we can count on each other as friends. We hang out with each other, at least we should. We need to come out of our homes, our caves. We need to dwell together in common cause and we need to know that we are not just an organization, but we are a family. We're called to community. Though we may have different last names, we are one in the spirit. But somebody say amen. He also enables faith, for faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the, the word of God. God gives you your faith. For you are for it is by grace that you are saved through, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. The Holy Spirit works in tandem with the Holy Word of God. And just as two are required in conception, the two are required for someone to be again born the second time. It enables us to have, He enables us to have faith. He also enables us to love each other, to forgive each other, and to work together. The gifts of the Spirit are also divided among the body the same way that the, the liver cannot do the job of a kidney or the heart can do not, not, cannot do the job of the brain. Each and every one of you have been equipped by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit to perform a function within the church. If you do not engage in the congregation that you are called to, be it this one or some other, you are denying yourselves the blessing of being a part of the family of God and you are denying your brothers and sisters the blessing that only you can provide because you have been equipped to provide it. It works both ways. You are robbing yourself of a bit of joy that God has in store for you, and you're robbing, your, you're robbing the others the joy that you provide. Every believer has at least one gift of the Spirit. It's our responsibility to figure out what that is, and it might not be something you enjoy. I have horrifying stage fright. The first church I was ever at a, a choir director at, I almost threw up several times before Christmas cantatas, even though my back was to the congregation. And yet I was someone that God had called to preach and to help others lift their voice in song. God doesn't necessarily equip us to do something that we think we're going to enjoy. But if we're obedient, guess what? You do end up enjoying it. Whether you're afraid of it or not, be obedient. Let God take the responsibility. Because he will. These are talents that equip us for ministry, and no two people are gifted exactly alike. But that is what allows us to function the same way a body functions. There are several gifts that I'll talk about here in brief because we're going to talk about some of these tonight. When we talk about prophecy in the New Testament, since we're talking about seeing God's truth as it plays out in our midst, when we not future casting. When we talk about leadership, we talk uh, leadership in the context of the Holy Spirit means providing others with vision, administration. The gift of administration are those wonderful people who are able to take the vision once it's been handed to them 
This, this is how God makes sure that no one person can do it alone. Also, that no one person ends up trying to put upon themselves the place of Christ. Someone gives a vision, someone else takes it like a jigsaw puzzle and puts it together. The fine details, the individual numbers, the, 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 the facts, the timetables, and all that. He's the, the, the person of administration is the person who takes the vision and makes it into a reality. The evangelist is someone who can communicate the gospel, communicate it with boldness, and draw others through the power of the Spirit to conviction in tandem with the Word of God. Those who are preachers are those who ignite a passion within the hearts of believers for spiritual growth. Those who are teachers open the Word of God and help them to see it in clarity. Do you, are you with me so far? They're not the same thing. Those who have the gift of, of hospitality are able to, no matter what the space is, they're able to present the person who comes into their space with a sense of peace and comfort. And sometimes they're fantastic cooks too. There's the spirit of discernment that helps to, to figure out the underlying attitudes and the underlying motivations behind the heart of the person that that person is with. And this is all required so that the four ministries of every local church have an advocate so that no one single ministry overpowers the other and causes the local church to fall into being a parachurch ministry instead of a local church. The four responsibilities that we have are to provide worship, to provide for missions, which is the relief of those who are suffering, evangelism, the, the carrying of the gospel message, and discipleship, the education and spiritual growth of the believer. All of us are responsible for both fulfilling these ministries and for advocating for them, holding, the, holding them in tension so that they get accomplished. And that's where we come to our mission. The Holy Spirit making sure that the work of Christ is performed in the body of Christ through those that he leaves on this world. And we get an example of that being fulfilled at the bottom of Acts chapter 2. And I want you to read this with me. Acts 2, starting with verse 42. So after the Holy Spirit has come down, after the apostles have gathered the 3,000, one sermon, 3,000 converts, that's the difference the Holy Spirit can make for those that are obedient to his call. And as this new community starts to gather, I want you to read how the Word of God describes this church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles, at the outpouring of God's love made possible by spirit-filled believers. All believers were together and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Not, I want you to notice that they were not compelled to do so. They were not forced into doing so. But they did so out of their own free will. Out of the love that God had given them. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread and in their homes they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. This is a community not just in the meeting house, not just in the sanctuary. They went to each other's homes. They were part of each other's lives. When someone had an issue, they were there. Not just one person, not just with cards and letters, even though those are vital. But if someone had an issue, they were there together as a group. They ate together, they lived together, they studied scripture together, they grew spiritually together. They loved the people together. They did mission works together. They spread the word of God together. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people, not just their fellow believers. You demonstrate love to the community. The community responds in kind. The Lord added to their number weekly during the morning worship hour. The Holy Spirit added to their number daily daily those who were being saved so the Holy Spirit does this for us 
The Spirit creates intimacy between the believer and God. The fruit of the Spirit enables the community to exist within the church. The Holy Spirit also gifts the individual believer so that the ministry of the church can continue and continue well. So this is the challenge that we have. I want you to notice, I do pick these pictures with intention. The first picture that you saw had someone's hands outstretched receiving the light. Once they receive the light, you see this person holding up the cross. And what are they doing? They're shining the light. They're giving the light to others. This is what we are called to do. You have been blessed. What are you doing with that blessing? How are you being a steward of that blessing that you've been given? You have been given the Holy Spirit of God. Are you working alongside him? Are you ignoring his presence? Are you being obedient to his call? Are you offering excuses that it's too hard? Not knowing that he's the one that takes responsibility and he's the one who will strengthen you for the cause. Having received the light... Are you shining it for others? This is the challenge of Pentecost. Now that we have such a great and tremendous blessing, heirs, co-heirs with Christ, bearers of the Holy Spirit, walking temples of the living God because God dwells in you, you have been blessed. Christ commands us now, be a blessing to others. And all God's people said, Heavenly Father, as we now come to your table, Lord, as we remember the blood that was shed to make possible our fellowship with you, to make possible that connection that we share through your Spirit. Help us to hear the Spirit's call. Open our ears to your voice. Grant us the courage that whatever the challenge is, that we may meet it, and that through your strength it might be overcome. Help us to realize, Lord, that if we are but obedient to you, you will give us the victory, just as you always have. And we thank you and praise your holy name for all the times that you have given us the victory, that though the challenge looked to us insurmountable, Lord, that we know that you found a way. So as we come into the sacred time, Lord, for the times that we have not loved you above all else, for the times that we have not loved our neighbor as ourselves, for the times that we have not treated your house and your family with the love that they deserve, for the times that we did not hear your call to comfort the needy, to be and stand with those who mourn, to minister in your name or to proclaim your word for the times we have sinned, the times we have failed. We come to you asking for your, for your forgiveness, holding to this promise that if we confess our sins, Lord, that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Cleanse us of our unrighteousness. That as we approach your table, we may do so with a free heart in celebration of the God who loves us so. In the matchless name of Christ, we pray. Amen.
and go ahead and prepare the elements. I hope that in my ministry with you, you've grown in your understanding of the sacredness of this event. That while we claim this as an ordinance, this is nevertheless the time that we reflect on what Christ has given for us. Will we meet him in prayer We celebrate the fact that he gave so much for us and he's giving still. And with gleeful anticipation, we work until we see our faith made sight at his appearing. On the night that he was betrayed, just as the thousands of years before, he was gathered with his closest friends that he called his brothers. And he took the moths of the unleavened bread of Israel, symbol of purity and sinlessness. In that instance also the symbol of the meat of the first Passover lamb, the sacrifice that was given for the freedom of the nation Israel. And he lifted up that ancient prayer that blessed it. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, that brings forth the bread from the earth. But then he added this phrase, now take and eat, for this is now my body, broken for you, for the forgiveness of sin. The promise of a new kind of redemption, a new kind of freedom, not the slavery of a political entity, but the slavery of the sin nature itself, so that you may be free to be called the children of God. Brother Roger Jarrett, would you ask the blessing on the bread, please? body of Christ broken for you. And likewise, he took the cup. A cup full in Israel is a symbol of joy. And during this Seder meal, it was also called the cup of redemption, celebrating freedom. And as he again blessed the fruit of the vine, he added a special prayer, a special command, excuse me. Now this is the New Testament, the new covenant, the covenant of grace in my blood poured out for you. Do this, celebrate this, remember this. Always. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Brother Vernon Kay, would you ask the blessing of the cup?
the blood of Christ poured out for you. And when the meal had concluded, they gathered together and sang.